Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise, His greatness no one can fan. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today knowing that we have failed to speak lovingly, think purely, or act rightly. We have sinned against you and against others in wasting the precious time you give to us, in our slowness and hesitancy to spread your gospel, in the faithful care of our relationships, in our restless and relentless preoccupation with worldly wealth, in caring for the bodies and minds you have given us, in our refusal to make you our first priority. Hear our confession, for we have sinned and are in need of your mercy and forgiveness. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And he has. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. And in the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, the giver of life and the source of all love, we know that all we have received comes from your gracious hand. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and to teach us to share them generously. Send your Holy Spirit to work through us that many more might come to know the saving riches of your Son. And may our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of your Son in our hearts, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. There's a part of me that doesn't like doing it any more than you like hearing it. It's talking about money in church. Why does God do that? There's so many more important things to talk about in church, right? 
God knows that. He knows the very most important thing that you and I need for this life and eternal life is the riches that he gave to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And it's because of that that he does talk to us about our possessions. And really, it's not our stuff, it's the attachment we have to our stuff. Because that directly affects the attachment we have to God. As is the case of our first reading. God found his people with a distracted and, and, and very thin attachment to him. And it was because of the stronghold they had on their stuff. And so God directly... Um, he talks about this to them and reminds them to put their heart back on him so that he can fill them up with all the good things they're searching for in their stuff. So our first reading is from the prophet Haggai as God talks to his people. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, but only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber. And build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, on all the labor of your hands. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Alleluia. As is our custom, we invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel as it records the very words and works of Jesus, our Savior. And so once again, Jesus warns of the dangers of being worldly-minded. He says it's really it's a trap. It's a trap ready to snag and pull you away from God, uh, which is the very worst thing that could ever happen to us here on earth. But uh, he invites us to find our true treasure in Christ, the very best thing that we have here on earth and eternal life as well. Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. <coughs> Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then, he, and then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yield an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Well, then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, 
but is not rich toward God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Maybe seated for our next hymn. Our next hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. That's the name into which you were baptized. And I wanted to start out very deliberately with that name because before we can begin a sermon today, talking about the area of our life and uh, the finances and, and giving that God has blessed us with, you and I, we need to take a journey. We need to take a journey up to the baptismal font, to the waters of baptism. And the reason we need to do that first is, is this. This is what we believe about baptism. Baptism means that the old Adam, that sinful nature in us, should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil lusts. And that a new person daily come forth and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. We need to take a journey to the font because as we turn to God's word today and he talks about an area of life that we keep very private and close to ourselves, the sinful nature in us wants to rise up, wants to cross its arms, roll its eyes, maybe kick 
and scream and convince us that we don't need to talk about this. We've learned everything we know. We are in charge of our finances. It tries to convince us that we shouldn't talk about this because it's just the church trying to get more money out of us. So I want you to take that old sinful nature right now and drown it in the water of baptism. Let it die. Because when we do that, this new person of faith that God has created in each one of us arises and that new person in each and every one of you is eager to hear God's word, eager to hear what God has to say about every aspect of our life because he's a God of grace, even in the area of giving. So will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we come to you today in your word, we, we confess that at times we have trouble talking about this particular area of our lives. That sinful nature in us wants to have control. But Lord, you have drowned that nature through the waters of baptism and made us your dear children. And now we ask that you would speak to the new person in us and make us eager to hear what you have to say. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we can start our sermon. We're going to concentrate on God's word from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And these are the words. God is able to make all grace overflow to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will overflow in every good work. As it is written, he scattered. He gave to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. And he who provides seed to the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing and will increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you may be generous in every way, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. This is God's word. Once in a while, when you're watching the news on TV, you hear good news stories, right? And I've noticed that a lot of times the good news stories are, are, are about, uh, sometimes are about generous tippers. Have you ever seen those news stories? A couple of examples. Uh, there was a, a waitress who was very pregnant, and she must have been talking to one of her fellow waitresses about how she's a little nervous. Uh, things were tight. She wasn't sure how it was going to go with a new member of the family. So she, when she's... Uh, Cleaning up the the table and she looks at her receipt, she sees a $900 tip. $900 tip. Can you believe that? There was another uh, story of a man from Ireland who was living in America. He's a college student and uh, he was talking to his people he was serving about wanting to go home for the holidays, but he wasn't able to do that. So later on, he's cleaning up and he sees on his tip a $750 tip. Hope this gets you back to Ireland for the holidays, he says. Those are pretty fun, aren't they? Generous tip. Whenever I hear these stories, there are two reactions I have. Number one, I'm thinking, maybe I should be a waiter. <laughs> but the second one I have, and I even find this interesting of myself, but I'm being honest here, I usually say something like this. I wish I could be that generous. That just seems like a lot of fun, doesn't it? wish I could be that generous. I remember the very first time that I had that thought, that thought process going through my mind. It wasn't at a restaurant. It wasn't while I was watching the news. I was for sure not 10 years old yet, so I was was a fairly young child. I was sitting at the kitchen table in our family's house. Mom and dad were there talking about what they were going to give for their offering the next day in church. And they weren't fighting. They weren't shaking their heads. They weren't scowling. They were actually smiling and nodding. And then I saw my dad write the number on the checkbook, on the check, and and my jaw dropped. To me, that was a huge number. I couldn't believe it. And I thought to myself, wow, I wish I could be that generous. I'm just curious if you've ever 
had that thought process go through your mind? Have you ever said something like that? That would be so fun. I, I wish I could be that generous. I'm guessing that as a child of God, you have had that thought. You see, we talked about that new person of faith just a second ago. That new person of faith inside of you has that desire. And God wants to speak to that new person of faith today and he wants to show you how you can be that generous and how you can be that happy about it. So let's take a look at these words here. God describes this desire of wanting to be generous right before our text. The, the very last words before we read these words are this. God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giver, that's a good description of someone desiring to be generous and being happy about it, right? It's interesting when you see that phrase, a, a cheerful giver, there, are, there is an automatic assumption. If you're going to be a cheerful giver, there must be resources from which you can draw on. So there must be resources that make you cheerful. There must be resources that make you able to give. Right? Simple assumption. It's interesting then that when God talks about cheerful giver and people having resources for this, that God doesn't take us to a restaurant where a wealthy man is giving a $900 tip. He takes us to some very real people just like you and me who got together and formed a very real congregation just like this one. And he could be talking about St. John's and you and me for all intents and purposes, but, but he's talking about a group of people like you and me at a church in a city called Corinth. That's where we get the name Corinthians for the book. The Corinthian people. And it's interesting that God would take us to these people when he's talking about cheerful givers because, well, it doesn't take a lot of investigation into the background of the Corinthians to realize they don't seem like they would have the resources for this kind of thing. Sometime go back to 1 Corinthians and just read through the headings of the chapters. And you'll see a description of these Corinthian people. They were uh, struggling with sexual sins very openly in their congregation. Um, they did not get along with each other. Part of it was because they struggled with pride and arrogance. This person thought they were better than the other one. This one thought they were more powerful than the other one and more gifted. Um, there were people trying to divide the congregation. And, and the way Paul describes it is that they were multi-minded. Instead of everybody in unity on a single thing, they were, all their resources were being diverted spiritually. They were trying to find happiness here and happiness there, and they were completely depleted. It's an ugly picture, these Corinthians, of depletion and poverty, spiritually, and then also it affected them in every area of their life. So now when we get to 2 Corinthians, and we see Paul talking about an offering, you almost laugh. You see, Paul's going around to all the churches that he started, and he's collecting an offering to help people out in Jerusalem. And yes, he comes to the Corinthians. And when you're reading through, you go, oh boy, <laughs> how are these people going to be able to give? It's almost laughable to think they're going to give, let alone do it with a smile on their face and be cheerful about it. No way. But if you're having those thoughts like I am, then I want you to realize something. Where are we looking that makes us think that way? We're looking at the Corinthian people. We're looking at their depleted resources. And so we come to the conclusion that that's impossible, right? When we look at them, when we look at their depleted resources, we think, well, it's impossible. They can't be cheerful givers. I want you to notice, though, where the Holy Spirit points our eyes. Where does the Holy Spirit point our eyes? Verse 8. God is able to make all grace overflow so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will overflow in every good work. Where does the Holy Spirit point our eyes? On God. Impossible is not in God's vocabulary. We could just stop and stare all day at those first three words. God is able. <laughs> 
And what is he able to do? He's able to make his grace abound in everything, in every area of your life. And that's what he did for the Corinthians. It's, it's a picture of contrast. Before, we looked at the Corinthians, and it was a picture of depletion and poverty. And now when we look at God, it's this picture of God just opening his heart of loving kindness and just overflowing the Corinthians with grace. God just dumping grace on them, more than they could handle. His grace sent his son Jesus into this world, not to condemn, but to actually forgive those very sins we just talked about. God sent his Holy Spirit into their lives so that they would turn away from that sin and to Jesus. God's grace gave them a heart transplant. That old heart is gone and this new heart of faith is in them so that they find happiness and contentment and, and everything they need in Christ. What God is saying is that those resources needed for cheerful giving... God gives it. And what it is, is grace. If they had grace, they had the resources for cheerful giving. And we know that's true because look at the result. The last verse of our text, verse 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you will have complete single-mindedness of heart which produces thanksgiving to God through us. I put a very literal translation of what that says. But it's awesome, isn't it? Before, they were multi-minded. They were looking here and there and everywhere, and they was depleting their resources. But now, they had a single-mindedness of heart. God's grace changed them. They were focused on God and his grace, and that completely changed them as people, and it completely changed them as a congregation. If they had God's abounding grace, then they had every resource they needed. They had the resource for joy and cheer, and they had resource to be able to be generous in their giving. God's grace is the resource. So now as we start this three-week series talking about the area of our Christian life called giving, I wonder how people might describe us. Remember how when we looked at the Corinthians and we said, oh boy, there's no way that they're going to give. If, if, if the community or our friends or our family knew we were having this series, how would they describe you and me? How would they describe our congregation? Might they say, wow, that, yeah, they're cheerful givers? Or might they at times describe us the way the Corinthians were? Oh, boy. It's an interesting thought to have, isn't it? Speaking to the new person of faith in each one of us, right? I think we can be honest that we each have sins just like the Corinthians that end up depleting our resources in every area of our life. We look for happiness and contentment and joy in all kinds of different things. And so, what are those things? What are those things that deplete our resources for cheerful giving? What are those things that put a challenge in our way of, of being a cheerful giver? <coughs> Might it be hesitancy or cautiousness? Maybe uh, that fear of being irresponsible? Wanting to always be conservative because you just never know? I know those ones because they came from my heart. So what are yours? Those things don't sound half as bad as what the <laughs> Corinthians were suffering, do they? In fact, they actually sound pretty noble and, and pretty proper. Until, until you put those values next to God's description of one of his dear children being a cheerful giver. God gives us an amazing description of a cheerful giver in verse 9 of our text here. Maybe at first you thought it was talking about God, but this is actually a quotation from Psalm 112. And Psalm 112 is the description of somebody responding to God's gifts. How do they act? They scatter. They give to the poor. 
want to talk about that picture because if you understand that picture and you consider yourself to be cautious or afraid not to be irresponsible, afraid of being irresponsible or, or wanting to be conservative, then this is offensive to you and me. It really is. This is a picture of, of farming and you've got to think ancient farming. So I want you to think about, first of all, the seeds. If you're an ancient farmer, just a Honest question, where do you get your seeds? You don't go to Pioneer or DeKalb or whatever the seed store is. There's no seed companies. So how do you get your seeds? You have to, first of all, have a field planted. And you can't harvest your whole field for yourself. You have to save a portion of that field so that it gets beyond ripe and produces the flower and then you gather painstakingly all the seeds from that section. And what part of the field do you have to save for seed? Well, if you're a good farmer and you want the good crops next year, you don't save the bad stuff. You save the best. The seed is harvested from, harvested from the best seed. So if you think about that and you're a farmer and you have that seed in your hand, what are you holding? You're holding something that represents a lot of your hard work. You're holding something that represents a great deal of your resources. You're holding something in your hand that represents the very best of what you have. And so you can understand that idea of being conservative and being cautious because that's precious. You want to hold it close, right? But what's the picture God uses? With that seed, what does the farmer do? scatters, just gives it away. Oh, isn't that offensive? How can he do that with that precious resource? How can he do that with his very best? It's this picture of just recklessly flinging it and not caring where it goes. How can the child of God have that kind of an attitude with the very best of our resources. Look again where we are focusing. If we're nervous about that and cautious and conservative, we're probably looking at ourselves, our own skills, our own wisdom, our own abilities. We're looking at our own stuff. But where does the Holy Spirit point you? How can he do this? Verse 10. He who provides seed to the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing and will increase the harvest of your righteousness. Where does God point you? To him. And he has some awesome names here. God is called the supplier. He's the one who supplies. If a farmer is holding seed in his hand, what does it imply? There was a successful harvest the year before. And if there was a harvest the year before, what does that imply? There was a harvest the year before. God is the supplier. And not just the supplier, what else does it call him? The multiplier, the increaser. Not only did the farmer hold the seed in his hand, but he had a harvest in his barn. He had food and bread on his table. God is just so generous. This is, again, a picture of abundance. God takes what we have and just multiplies. Isn't that a beautiful picture, not of farming anymore, but of God and his grace in your life? You're absolutely right in your thinking. It seems... So wasteful of God to look down on a rebellious world and have any feelings for it, let alone love. It seems like such a waste, and yet look what God did. To that world, he gave and gave and gave, and gave his best, his only son, our Savior. You're absolutely right. It, it seems just irresponsible to bring soiled hearts like yours and mine, into his holy family? And then look what God did. 
He just scattered his water and word of cleansing on these very hearts. So we're clean. It seems so reckless for God to just keep revisiting repeat sinful offenders like you and me. And yet look what God does. Every week he meets us at this altar with the body and blood of his son and says, I forgive you. And where that forgiveness comes from, there's plenty more. And even physically, it just seems foolish of God to keep placing in these hands income, clothes, and food when all these hands want to do is hold on to it and grab it and treasure it. Seems foolish of God to keep putting that in my hands and your hands. But what does God do? In his loving kindness, he only seems to multiply and enlarge our blessings every single year. That's who God is. God is able to make all grace abound so that in everything, every single area of your life, from your soul to your bodies and everything in between, you have everything you need. It's God's promise. So how can we be cheerful givers? I would look at it this way. When we see God's heart open and so full of grace, how can we not have the same heart within us? One last quick story for an application. Uh, just recently, I was kind of embarrassed of myself, uh, and it has to do with tipping and receipts and things like that. I, my brain works weird where I almost have to have round even numbers, right? It can't be like $20 and 32 cents or something like that. It's gotta be 20 or 25. So I, I, get, the, I get the bill. And I was so impressed with myself. My math skills were on that day, and I knew exactly the number to get it in even amount. So I quickly wrote it down, and I walk into my car all proud of myself. And on the way home, I'm thinking, oh my goodness. The number was even, but man, was I stingy. That poor waitress. <laughs> and the problem was, I was so focused on the numbers that I forgot to be thankful for the great service that she gave us and the food and the experience that I enjoyed. Here's my point. Isn't it interesting that in this whole discussion today so far about giving, we haven't talked about numbers once? That's so often where we want to focus. But instead of focusing on numbers, where does God put our focus? His grace, His grace, His grace. So here's the application. Here's what you can take home today. As you go and you think about your thank offering, as you sit down to prepare your offering for Sunday morning or whenever you give, what's the first thing that you need? Is to check what your bank balance is or checkbook or your wallet or your phone or computer because we have electronic giving now. Um, what, what is the first thing you need? It's none of those. It's this. It's your Bible. Right? If you want the resources to be a cheerful giver, God's grace is it. His words and promises remind you that he is able to make all grace abound in all things in every area of your life. So when you are able to ponder that and, and to put away the exceptions and to put away the what-ifs and just believe that, that's when you're ready. That's when you can stop saying, man, I wish I could be generous. Instead say, wow, I can be generous when my heart reflects God's heart. Amen. May the peace of God that goes beyond our understanding guard to keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now, dear people of God, dear children of God, we have this opportunity to say thank you to God for all the blessings, spiritual and physical, by bringing him our offerings. Um, one quick thing today, um, we do have a new option for giving. 
Uh, if you're so inclined and would like to give electronically, you can text this give to this number or uh, go to stjohnslutheran.com slash give those are just a, an, or scan the QR code that's in the bulletin. Those are just options for you um, that are available. We'll be talking about it more in the next couple of weeks. But uh, uh, these are our ways to give thanks to our God. During the offering, I invite you to sign the friendship registers that are in our pews. Most gracious and generous God, today, once again, as every day, we are led by your Spirit to praise you and to thank you humbly and be in awe of you and all of the love you've given to us. You are the great determiner of times and places in which your people would live, and we have such a blessing that you, you chose us to live at such a time in, in the history of this world that we would get to enjoy so many earthly blessings and in such rich supply. We thank you for that, Lord. But we also confess in the same breath that uh, the generosity of your heart has tempted our sinful hearts at times to be multi-minded, to uh, be depleted uh, from the right attitude in a heart in which to receive and use these blessings from your gracious hand. There are so many distractions in our life, Lord, and when uh, prompted by our sinful hearts, we use them so often selfishly, or we, we save them up and hoard them um, for ourselves. And please forgive us for not reflecting the kind of grace and generosity that flows from you. But thank you, Lord, again for showing us your son, Jesus and the abundance, the grace upon grace, which we have received through him. And that grace is nothing short of a miracle, that you, you gave your own son Jesus to be everything we needed in this life, uh, to give us a perfect life that he gave and put on our ledger, and then to have your son suffer an eternity's worth of punishment uh, to pay all of our debts. Thank you, Lord. And we will thank you every day of our life and then all of eternity for such rich 
and gracious love that you've given to us in your Son. And Lord, we ask that this would be the, the spirit-moving means in our hearts by which you make us single-minded. As we as a congregation, as families and as individuals, every day go back to the fount of your grace that we are led to be generous and show that our hearts belong to you. And please use your, your people and your congregation here in Hastings to show the world what generosity and love looks like. Uh, please open up our, our hearts and also our resources uh, to be of, of great benefit and value to the ministry here, but to the world around us. And Lord, always remind us that um, we can never outgive you because you gave us your son and that's everything we'll ever need. We thank you for such rich and loving grace. And we continue to pray and, and, and offer our prayers together in the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And speaking of God's riches and grace, let's prepare our hearts to receive the blessing of his holy supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And now lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past, he spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
oh, what rich grace, brothers and sisters, that all of us have received today, that God's word is sure, both in the word we heard and the sacrament we received, that in Jesus Christ you are loved, you are forgiven, you are secure. Let's stand and give him thanks in our prayers. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Maybe seated for our closing hymn.